Um, good morning, members. No. Good morning, Chairman. Um, we're we're courted by the looks of things. Uh, there's more than five members, including myself. Um, hopefully, you have no issues with Starleaf. All of you that are on, anyway, we've done a bit of a test there, so seems to be working okay. Um, Can I come in? Yeah. Hello. Hi, Chair. Sorry, Deputy Miss Claire. I'm having a lot of trouble here with the technology, so I'm. I can't get camera and I couldn't get Starleaf open, so I'm going to leave and try and rejoin again if that's okay. We can hear you okay, Claire. We just can't see you. Will that be good? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm going to get my pixelated Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's up to yourself. You, the, um, yeah, you can try and come in with the camera you want, but we can't hear you if you can hear us. No bother, well, let's stay without the video, that's okay with me. Yeah, that's okay at all, no problem. We look forward to your pixelation a little later, maybe. Uh, okay, so, members, you know the story. Keep your microphones muted until it's time to speak because um, the system is very sensitive and uh, background noises can disrupt the audio. Um, okay, the meeting will be broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. You can use your mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and muted. Um, um, I want to advise members that uh, the meeting will move into closed session at the end to um, to, co to consider uh, uh, an agenda item relating to the ports. Uh, first item on today's agenda is apologies. We don't have one. Sorry, Patsy uh, uh, may be joining us a little bit later. He has another engagement uh, right now. And uh, so, Chairperson's business, I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page five, which provides details of two committee stakeholder events scheduled for the 17th of June. Nick, do you want to brief the committee on this? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, members, uh, draw your attention to the memo in the pack regarding planned stakeholder events to be held on the 17th of June. This is in relation to the ongoing call for evidence on the Climate Change Bill. Members will recall two or three weeks ago it was agreed as part of the Forward Work pro Programme that we would hold um, on the 17th two stakeholder events, one in the morning, which is scheduled from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and one in the evening from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. These will be um, on an online uh, basis using the Zoom platform, and the purpose really is to provide stakeholders with an opportunity to come together and discuss some of the key issues relating to the Climate Change Bill. Um, on page one of the memo, the proposed running order is outlined for both events, which is broadly uh, fairly identical. So there will be a welcome and introduction that will be facilitated by the Assembly's engagement manager. Uh, the, we will then have a, a short introduction and overview of the Climate Change Bill as it is drafted by, by, by the Chair. The proposal then is that, depending on the number of confirmed attendees, there would be breakout rooms facilitated via Zoom which would allow uh, stakeholders to answer three, uh, discuss three key questions relating to the Climate Change Bill um, and take their views on that. And it is hoped that, in addition to members of the committee staff team being in each room, there would also be a member of the Assembly's engagement team. And we would also ask for uh, committee members to be present if they are available and be in the rooms. Following the uh, breakout room discussion, there would then be a 45-minute or so uh, plenary discussion session uh, that will be facilitated by myself, and that will be an opportunity for each of the feed, uh, breakout rooms to provide feedback on the key questions before the session is then wrapped up. On page two of the memo, we've listed out the three key questions that are be considered uh, in each of the events. So in the morning event, which will be in, um, sent out to the key organisations that the committee has identified to hear evidence from already in its call for evidence, it is proposed to ask the following. Is it possible to reach the net zero green greenhouse gas emissions target by 2045 as set out in the bill? How will the plan to reach this target impact on different sectors of our economy? And do we need a climate change commissioner? And if so, what power should they have? For the evening event, which will be specifically targeted for 
representatives of young people and um, networks of, of youth youth groups. The three key, key questions um, are, are worded as follows. The bill plans to achieve balance between the greenhouse gases released by our society and the amount taken in from the atmosphere by 2045. What do you think of this? How will key areas such as farming, transport and energy be affected by this plan? And how should the government monitor progress against the target? And do you think an independent commissioner would help to do this? It is hoped that there will be approximately 25 to 30 stakeholders attending each of the events on the 17th of June, and the Assembly engagement team has kindly agreed to facilitate the issuing of invites and confirmation of responses. Um, and it is proposed that, uh, subject to committee approval today on this plan, that those invites will go out this week, and um, I can keep members updated on the receipt of any invitations. That's uh, the end of the briefing, Chair. Um, thank you for that, Nick. Um, and I want to um, certainly I want to com com commend this stakeholder event. I think it's important that everyone uh, has their say in this, uh, either those who are in favour of this or, or those who are not, or who maybe want to see a different approach taken. Um, I also want to particularly welcome the fact that there is a dedicated section for for young people because uh, climate change. It's an issue which will affect their futures, and I think that it's important that, that we make great efforts to reach out to young people to make sure their voices are heard. So, uh, certainly, I, I, I want to commend that uh, stakeholder event as part of the wider uh, consultation process uh, for this bill. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I think that uh, that members members at some point should uh, indicate to Nick um, whether with their attendance uh, the, their, whether there'll be attendance for these stakeholder events. Uh, Philip, are you looking to come in there? Yeah, yes, Chair. I mean, I echo all your your uh, comments on the importance of this, and just in your last point about indicating whether we're able to attend. Can can I the third? It's on the Thursday, the seventeenth of June. So. Am I right in saying that the morning engagement session is in place of our normal committee meeting so that we will be able to attend? That's correct, Philip. So the morning event um, is scheduled between 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock. So yes, that is our normal meeting time. So it is hoped that members should be available, obviously, within that time of the week. And then um, I suppose if members could indicate to me maybe over the next week or so their availability for the evening event so that I can then confirm um, how many members we will have to put in the breakout groups for the for the youth event. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Philip. Okay, so just let um, Nick know your availability for that evening event and you're right, um, I could be just mixed up there that, that this that will be the effectively be around the time of our committee meeting we hopefully will be available. Um, so I want to move on to item number three. Uh, the draft minutes from the meeting on the 20th of May. Um, members are okay with those? I'll take silence as consensus. <laughs> um, I'll sign these now uh, in a moment. Um, okay. And there's no particular matters arising. Okay, members, we're going to move on now to item five on today's agenda. It's a, a, an oral briefing. Uh, uh, from the Department on the Climate Change Bill. Uh, I want to refer to correspondence from the Department at page 23 of your pack, and that includes an update on progress of DERA's Climate Change Bill. And I want to welcome by Starleaf Colin Breen, Director of Environmental Policy Division, Arlene McGowan, Grade 7 Climate Change Branch, Anthony Courtney, Grade 7 Climate Change Branch, and I'd like to invite the officials to brief the committee, and then members will ask questions of the officials after that. So, you're very welcome this morning. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Are members okay? Great. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, well, good morning. Um, so, today, Chair, is really around uh, hopefully trying to provide some assistance with the scrutiny of the private members' bill. So I think I would like to start by saying I genuinely want a climate change bill for Northern Ireland and I want one that works for everyone. So you know, I'm available for the committee throughout the scrutiny at any time they require me. And I just wanted to put that offer in first of all. Um, you'll have noted that the minister um, has said that he will present the, de the department's draft bill to the executive for approval in the coming weeks. 
but really that's as much of an up, as an update I have on the department bill at this stage. But before I take your questions in relation to the private members bill as well, I just wanted to cover a few areas that have come up in the committee, in the assembly and in the media, just really to uh, help you with scrutiny. So uh, I've noted there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Northern Ireland will be doing less than their fair share and other regions of the UK will be picking up the slack if Northern Ireland don't aim for net zero. But this isn't actually true. So I just wanted to start with a quote from the Climate Change Committee in relation to UK action to get to net zero. The Climate Change Committee say, these actions will get the UK as a whole to net zero in 2050, but Northern Ireland to a reduction of 82% compared to 1990 levels. This figure does not mean lower effort, ambition or policy action. It represents equivalent effort being applied to Northern Ireland's specific circumstances. So um, that's really what they have said. Um, so as well as this, I am sure you'll be aware of the issues raised by the CCC with going too far in relation to reducing emissions, and in particular, the impacts on agriculture, where even a 50% reduction in livestock over and above the already challenging changes that is, are needed to be made will still not get us to net zero by 2050. So here's really, I suppose, your first question for endurance scrutiny. Should the agriculture sector here be so negatively affected for no overall UK or global gain? So uh, just to give you uh, a bit more on that, did you know that the difference between at least 82% and net zero for Northern Ireland, while this would be likely highly damaging to the local economy on the basis of current evidence, it would actually only correspond to a 0.73% reduction in overall UK emissions. So I have to ask all of you to balance the economic impacts of aiming for net zero for Northern Ireland as opposed to the UK as a whole, with the overall benefit to the UK being recognised in that we play a vital role in food production. So as such, an 82, at least 82% reduction is a fair and equitable contribution. So I really ask, should we not follow this expert advice? Uh, or to put it another way, uh, some of the other advice that the CCC have said that there's a potential extra 900 million pounds per annum cost to help Northern Ireland reach net zero by 2050, not even 2045, if engineered removal technologies were used. And so I really have to question whether, is it really worth it for an extra 0.73% reduction in UK emissions, which can still be achieved in the UK as a whole without that cost? And then we have to ask who would pay those extra costs. So having done a bit of digging and having used the assembly research paper, it appears that the HMT principles in allocating funding, principle 10, it would indicate that any such cost would be borne directly by Northern Ireland and not funded through UK government. So I think these are all very essential and important questions for you to consider during detailed scrutiny. And then further, on the question of advice, I've heard some of the CCC advice being paraphrased and used as justification for significantly more stretching targets than the CCC have categorically advised. The particular bit that I'm referring to is that the CCC have said that their land use modelling does not take account of the greenhouse gas impacts of using some land for less intensive farming, such as agroecology farming or for other uses, such as wildflower meadows. Now, I have to say, I did have to search quite hard to find this one. But it appears on page 171 of the 448 page sixth carbon budget report. And in that paragraph, it directs the reader to chapter seven of the 340 page methodology report. So, and in that report, there are over 50 pages of information on all of the modeling and scenarios that CCC have used to take account in relation to the land use sector. The agroecology bit was simply a paragraph identifying some areas which had not been included in what was a very comprehensive modelling exercise, and it is just good practice to highlight any areas not taken into account in open and transparent modelling. So I would like you, the committee, to appreciate that some further actions which may sequester carbon are not a magic answer. They will all need weight against possible unintended consequences achievability, and also against the potential other uses for what is a very limited land resource in Northern Ireland. Now, it is a highly complex area. This is why the department and indeed the other UK governments rely upon the CCC evidence and advice rather than going it alone. So uh, to try and uh, 
cover this off as well. I personally tried to further investigate the role of agroecology in reducing emissions. And whilst it's clear that the less intensive farming practices that agroecology promotes can reduce emissions, it, you know, it has been said a number of times, it's not a quick transition. And so to assume it is the answer to agriculture also reaching net zero is a stretch. Um, like the CCC, after my research, I have concluded there simply isn't enough information on this to draw reasonable or reasoned conclusions. So I believe the CCC have been sound in their recommendations. So I would again question the argument that just because an item hasn't been fully modelled, that this means that the CCC advice is somehow lacking in this respect. And so the explanatory and financial memorandum of the private members bill states it's informed by the best available science. But in this instance, on the basis of my research and on the research of the CCC, it seems that the best available science is that there's just not enough information on this area yet to make assumptions and set targets on it. So once more, the question is, do we follow the CCC advice in developing this bill as the other jurisdictions have, or do we not? Uh, so now my next point is in relation to the concept of just transition and how the legislation will ensure a just transition. Uh, as drafted, I can't understand how there can be a guarantee of a just transition when the current evidence we have suggests that NI net zero by 2050 will have excessive costs and impacts. We don't have any real information on the impacts of net zero by 2045, but I think it's reasonable to assume that they would be even higher. Um, I know it's been highlighted that climate action plans will have rural needs assessments done, but they will ultimately be bound by the 2045 net zero target. So in essence, if the rural needs assessment says there will be too great of an impact on rural communities, what can actually happen? Um, this is something I believe needs to be much clearer in the bill. And likewise, although the cap is subject to a 16 week consultation, let's say for example, during the consultation, the energy sector says that net zero by 2045 isn't possible. Again, what can happen there? Because we're stuck with a legally binding target and the TEO are not permitted to reduce this target under the legislation. So you have to question what the consultation exercise around these would actually achieve and how can there be a just transition when the evidence suggests a balanced pathway and a credible Northern Ireland contribution would be at least 82% by 2050. The legislation as drafted gives no leeway and I think it needs to look at that really because uh, if, if it's working on using emerging evidence and science, it needs to have some ability to take that into account, not just to make the target stricter than one that's already not advised on. And so just a final point, I've been having some discussions with the CCC and they've raised a couple of points and now I'm sure you're uh, bringing them to committee for scrutiny as well, but uh, you can get some further detail at that stage. So they firstly questioned their ability to fulfil the advisory role envisaged in the private members bill, as their advice has been clearly disregarded for the headline target. And they've also said that the 2045 net zero target is so far beyond anything they have modelled or could model on a sound basis, that it appears likely Northern Ireland would simply have to buy carbon credits from elsewhere in the UK to meet the target, which to me equals costs with absolutely no benefits. And I really have to ask, you know, is that really the way we want to get to net zero? And is it really the best use of resources? Um, and th those are all really questions for yourselves. I probably don't have all of the answers, but I'm now happy to take any questions. Um, okay, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Colin, for that, uh, for that briefing on the, the department, Bill, and some of your analysis of the PMB as well. Um, I suppose... Uh, there's a couple of, of points that I uh, want to just raise before we turn around uh, to, to members. Um, one of them is, um, I know that the, 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 the position of the UK CCC uh, on this matter, but I suppose the, the, where, where, where a lot of people are confused is that how come in the south of Ireland they're moving towards, say, 2050 for um, carbon neutrality? And the department has set out uh, a series of on-farm actions for farmers and farms to achieve that there, and uh, and it's, they're not they're not referencing the need for herd cuts. And indeed, um, in fact, I've seen the AFA and other ac experts and people on the ground saying that um, that 
you know, haircuts, haircuts um, uh, isn't the immediate answer to this, but taking uh, on fire measures. So, what, what have you looked at any other experts in, in Ireland, you know, in, the, in this country here, uh, as in relation to this this matter? Because we're, we're hearing different pictures from different parts of the same island. I'm also concerned that if we uh, take a less ambitious target, um, you know, given bear in mind that our food is pro, the overwhelming majority of our food is produced and processed uh, across the island of Ireland. What would be the implications for our international reputation um, if one part of the island has achieved, achieved net zero uh, by 2050 in line with the Paris Accord, whereas this part of the island hasn't? Have you thought of any implications for trade and for our, for our agriculture, agri food sector? Yeah, so I suppose, I suppose the first thing to say is just, just to raise a few questions about the Irish Act. So the Irish Act doesn't actually commit to net zero. What it commits to is a national climate objective, which uh, talks about a climate neutral economy. And then climate neutral economy is defined as a sustainable economy in society where greenhouse gas emissions are balanced or exceeded by the removal of greenhouse gases. And there's no standard defini definition of climate neutral. But a related term, carbon neutral, and this, this does give me some uh, minor alarm bells, simply means offsetting emissions through other means without actually reducing emissions. So for example, climate neutrality could mean, and I'm not saying it does mean for the Irish Act, I think that'll be worked out through scrutiny, but it could simply mean that they count the emissions that are produced by the food in uh, the south of Ireland, but sold elsewhere as emissions on that country or else they buy back carbon credits. And it's it's a very odd wording. Uh, so I think there, there needs to be a bit more clarity around that uh, because it, it doesn't actually mention net zero anywhere. Uh, so in terms of other experts, so you know, the, the UK CCC are the, you know, the statutory advisory body and they are probably world renowned in their field of expertise. We do take information from other bodies, but we haven't got any level of similar detail that we have from the CCC and what they're saying is this is what's achievable. Uh, so w while we do take scientific evidence from a whole range of other people, at the end of the day, I think you know the CCC are the independent advisory body for the UK in legislation and they have provided significantly more information than any other people. And they are also drawing on all of the other scientific evidence and advice that's available. Uh, so, in terms of uh, having less ambitious targets, um, I, I'm I'm not sure that you, you could call even the at least 82 percent target in Northern Ireland less ambitious or unambitious. It's highly ambitious, and it will be incredibly stretching to get to it on the basis of current evidence. You know, we aren't even a quarter of the way there. Uh, and we've only another 30 years to get there. there. There are big, big changes needed and a big amount of reductions required. Um, so I'm not sure that I would call it less ambitious. Uh, possibly the Irish target's over ambitious given their emissions have increased over the last number of years rather than decreased. Uh, and in terms of the, you know, the implications, um, I think we'll I think what we're what the UK are selling is a, a UK net zero, and so I, I don't think there'll be any presentational issues with Northern Ireland playing their part in that. Uh, I think the, you know, I think there'd be more presentational issues with not coming forward and you know, not getting action started quick enough through uh, arguments over what level of target we can reach. Uh, I think you know. My, my position really is that we want a target that's achievable, but ultimately we need a climate change bill because, you know, yes, we can be left behind very quickly on a world stage, especially with all the food production in the north and south, if we don't uh, start to do something. So, so you don't believe that there's, the, the, like for example, we are, we, it looks like we're, we, we are making good progress in achieving a PGA status for our Irish grass-fed beef. So you don't believe that uh, if the, the northern part of the island where, where the beef is produced, um, which, which, which won't achieve its targets in line with the Paris Agreement, um, 
uh, that there'll be no differential impact that you know the south which will have achieved it the north won't you know and also you know the the north will west wales England, Scotland and the South of Ireland uh, are moving ahead for carbon neutrality by, uh, 20, by 2050. We, we won't be. So there's no implications. You think that that's no implications? It's not about the wrong message about the North of Ireland to the rest of the world, no? No, well, under the Paris Agreement, it's uh, the UK that would be getting to that, you know, as a whole. And uh, what, what essentially has been said is that, you know, for Northern Ireland to continue to play their part, as a food producer for the rest of GB, they will have a lower target to take their specific circumstances, but it's overall UK net zero. So I don't see any implication because the, the alternative really is that we simply move the food production of Northern Ireland elsewhere. Um, the CCC have been quite clear on this. And you know, if you look at the, the paths to net zero with current livestock numbers in Northern Ireland, it doesn't appear that you know, there's a credible pathway to net zero by 2050, and uh, you know the private members' bill is actually aiming for that by 2045. Uh, you know, as an official, all I can go on is the evidence and advice that I have. You know, I obviously yes, I want to be as ambitious as possible, but in an official capacity, I have to report on the evidence and advice we've been given and say what my assessment of that is. And my assessment is that on the basis of all that current evidence and advice, Northern Ireland cannot get to net zero by 2050, but we should certainly aim, you know, aim high. That's, that's where we're saying at least 82%. That doesn't stop us at 82%. As evidence and science emerges, those targets can be increased. And that's probably the only the question I would have with the private members bill. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no leeway there. There's no ability to move You've, the, the net zero by 2045 target is set in stone, even though we don't have the evidence to back it up. Um, even, even if there was a, you know, a target that to, to be reviewed in a few years or something like that. But I think, I think the question is, you know, why are we aiming for a target that doesn't give any sort of overall UK benefit? Possibly gives a lot of, as I've said in my opening remarks, possibly gives quite a lot of financial hurt to Northern Ireland, uh, money that could be probably better used elsewhere and does make a relatively small contribution to UK emissions and an even smaller, I think it's a, the, the difference between at least 82% and net zero for Northern Ireland is a 0.0073 impact on global emissions. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Colin, for that. Um, there's other members I'm sure, who I'm sure want to pick up on some of the issues raised. I'm going to move around the room. Um, John, John Blair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Colin, as well, and your colleagues for, for this information. Can I ask, Colin, um, so, so that we have a, a picture of what preparation the department had done prior to the introduction of the Private Members' Bill with, with all of the information that was apparently available? At what stage was the department at in relation to bringing forward its own bill at the time when the uh, Private Members' Bill was launched? And in addition to that, if we could ask also, you, you referred there to the. Oh, so, uh, sorry, John. Can I just just whenever before? Can I? Do you mean at the time the bill was introduced or the? Yeah. The, yeah okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted. Let me have a, a clear picture of that, uh, and also perhaps then a better understanding of why the private members' bill was brought. Uh, the the other issue is the uh, climate change committee six carbon audit, which I have referred to uh, previously at this committee. Um, I understand the, the uh, information you give us there around the detail and the information that they, they um, had to have in order to reach conclusions. However, if some of that information and evidence gathering was omitted, and that is not to criticise the committee with limited resource um, available, does it not therefore um, bring us to a reasonable conclusion that the outcome was an underestimation of the picture? Okay, so in relation to your first question, so when the bill was introduced in, really, what was it, the, in the start of May, uh, the department's bill was largely drafted. Uh, it is now, the, the department's bill is now fully drafted, but we have to get the explanatory and financial memorandum signed off by departmental solicitor's office and by legislative council and just tidy up some of the impact assessments. So at, at that stage, the bill was more or less, it was, 
it had sat, the, the policy proposal from the Minister sat in the Executive since the 24th of March, uh, uh, from what I understand, and weren't discussed or tabled at the Executive. But while that went on, we continued to develop the bill uh, in the expectancy that they would be discussed. So uh, the Minister announced on question time, I think it Monday or Tuesday, uh, sorry, I, can't remember. I think it was Tuesday, that uh, he now intends to present that draft bill to the executive in the coming weeks. So I think uh, Anthony, Arlene and I have been working very hard to just cross all the T's and dot all the I's in over the last few days. And you know, w there's a lot of approvals that are needed for an executive bill, even to produce a draft one. But it's, you know, it's, it's more or less there and it's more or less complete. So if it is tabled at the executive, uh, you should be able to see it very soon. And in terms of your other question about uh, the CCC and what was omitted, uh, I wouldn't say it was omitted. Uh, what they have said is they have looked at it and there isn't enough information and evidence to actually model with it. And uh, as I said in my opening remarks, I feel similar having researched it. There's just not enough uh, available science to say, yeah, this is what would be reduced by changing the land to wildflower meadows, for example. And uh, I suppose the, the end point is that uh, have we underestimated what can be done? There's also the, the question, John, have we overestimated what can be done? Because I don't know if you're aware, but the, the UK de degraded peatland emissions are going to be start to be included from next year or possibly from this year in Scotland. And in Northern Ireland, I believe that's over two megatons of carbon, which is uh, you know about 50% of the agriculture sector, for example. So in fact, we're, we're probably in six months time to a year's time going to be in a worse position than we were now and that we have more emissions because more emissions are being counted so th that's that's where my argument really is around the bill having the flexibility to take into account emerging evidence and advice and science uh, and I, I feel as the bill is current private members bill is currently drafted there's not enough leeway there but i think it's i don't think it's a, a massive deal to, to change it, to, to allow it a bit more flexibility. Because you really do want flexibility with something like this, because we don't have all the answers. We're nowhere close to having all the answers. And uh, as I say, you know, I'm not wed to anything other than I'm just saying this is what the official evidence and advice is. And that's that's really all I can do. I'm, you know, I wish to make no political or emotional points in any of this. I'm just Entire, just laying out what we have at the minute, and that's where I'd like to see more flexibility in the bill to be able to take account of all of this. Okay, so th thanks for that, Colin. I suppose finally, if we may, sure, um, on the on the issue of flexibilities or uh, arrangements around uh, get, getting there to, to targets, um, will the bill coming forward have built within it uh, arrangements to assist farmers, financially or otherwise, in, in reaching those targets? Uh, no, uh, the bill that we have drafted, um, and and indeed to the private members bill, you know, both of them will require other policies to be made in other sections. Once you start opening up uh, primary legislation to assisting farmers, for example, then it's a uh, essentially open season on amendments to assist every other sector, and you know, it wouldn't be a it would be a very long process over several years to get all of the amendments for all of the sectors in. So really what this bill does and I know what the private members bill also aims to do is you know set a framework for legally binding emissions reductions targets and set a pathway for how that might be achieved through carbon budgets reporting etc so uh, no I don't neither bill will will set that financial assistance you know the common agricultural policies coming up you know Sir Peter Kendall is doing his review there are lots of other things there are lots of other mechanisms and you know of course uh, there will be drivers such as supermarkets wanting less carbon intensive meat. So all those things will help with the financial side of things. But no, the, neither our bill or the departmental bill nor the private members bill gives uh, that sort of financial assistance provision because it, it just it would just be too complex really, John. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you. Um, Claire? You bring in Claire there, kid? Claire? Yeah. Can, Hi, can you hear yeah, me? Go for it, Claire. Thank, we hear you. Yeah. thank you, um, Chair. Thank you, Colin, and the team for 
been here today. Uh, apologies for the lack of vision, um, just technical problems going on. But Colin, just on the first point, I share your alarm bells as well with regard to the Republic's car carbon neutral terminology. Um, and I'm glad to hear that getting picked up as well. But I'm also picking up this, this private members bill, and I'm going to try and be as neutral as possible. Obviously, you know, with it's in my name and there's, you know, the, the, the cross party support and the members on that as well. But this bill was laid with the Speaker's office back in September 2020. And um, at that point, uh, where was the department's bill? OK, so at uh, September 2020, I wasn't even part of the, the bill team then, but my understanding, and uh, if I'm wrong, Arlene will correct me, was that a consultation was being drafted back in September 2020, and the CCC were being engaged to give us an idea of what Northern Ireland's equitable contribution would be, so which came in December, and the consultation also launched in and around December. Arlene, shake your head if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's so, correct. Yeah. 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 So uh, that, that's really where we were at that stage, Claire. Okay, so when this private members bill was laid then, um, we didn't even have the CCC's report, we didn't have their carbon budget report that came in December, um, and it was from there after the Minister had requested from them what Northern Ireland's fair share to the UK contribution, the net zero would be, and that's where the 82% came up. So the 82% come up a number of months after the laying of this bill with the Speaker's office. Am I'm sorry, I, right? I, 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 um, I didn't realise the bill was laid back in September at all. So I thought it was only, I thought it was very uh, a recent laying. So yeah, so the, the the sixth carbon budget report and the letter. So Minister Poots had already written to the CCC about what Northern Ireland's contribution would be at that stage, I believe, and the two came at the same time. So the sixth carbon budget report came, and then the letter from to Northern Ireland came, and that, that did cause a bit of confusion because the two came at the same time, and the terms are, be, are being used interchangeably. And I have to confess, I was using them interchangeably for the first couple of months, uh, but there were, were two separate things, both dealing with essentially the same thing of what the, the UK could do, but the sixth carbon budget report was very much about 2033 to 2037, I believe, at the time, whereas um, the letter to Northern Ireland was really what what would Northern Ireland's equitable contribution to net zero be, to UK sorry, net zero be? I, yeah, sorry, yeah, could I just add something as well? Um, the Minister actually uh, in February 2019 um, had actually written to the Climate Change Committee asking what an equitable contribution uh, for Northern Ireland to net zero would be. And the committee, uh, due to their work on the sixth carbon budget, um, held off providing that information until they had published their advice on the sixth carbon budget. So that's why we only received both in, in December. But the, the, but the minister had requested it um, yeah, practically as soon as he came in um, as minister for the department, within a matter of weeks. Okay, thanks. So that would have been February 20? No. 2019. Uh, I think it was February 2020. So was oh, apologies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, oh, sorry, apologies, 2020. Um, <laughs> Yeah. These, these years and months kind of blend yeah. into one another these days, don't they? That's the problem. Time moves so fast and there's so much to do. <laughs> but okay, so I just want to be clear. So in February 2020, the minister then wrote to the CCC, um, but we hadn't seen anything coming forward from the department. We know that the Climate Bill and an independent environment protection agency were given under the new decade, new approach. Um, there's been a number of debates at the Assembly, and the Minister has explicitly, by the way, um, told us that we're not getting an independent environment protection agency. But anyway, this bill was, this private member's bill was laid with the Speaker's office back in September. So before the, the, the CCC had reported and before this 82% had come up. So can I ask, and, and I know that the Minister was aware of that because I'd done media at the time with him as well. So maybe he didn't have a sight of the bill because it wasn't a public document, but he knew that it had been laid. Can I ask, was there any discussions within the department or from the Minister about engaging with the parties laying this bill? Um, or is there just, just maybe a desire not to engage at all? Uh, so I'll just cover it. In, 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 in terms of the Independent Environment Protection Agency, uh, you know, what the Minister has said is that 
there, there won't be one during this mandate because of the, the level of work involved in scoping it out, etc. So, you know, that is, it is a very large piece of work. You're talking about a, a current environment agency with maybe 500 plus staff. So to move to an independent agency isn't an overnight thing. Uh, but in terms of the discussions around the private members bill, uh, I don't think uh, we were. I don't think that we were engaged with on that. Um, so there, there really uh, yeah, hasn't been much. And in my time, you know, we, we weren't engaged with anyway. Yeah. The department um, was actually not um, officially made aware or seen the private members' bill until it was actually introduced to the assembly. Thank you very much. And Colin, going back to when you were saying about the CCC saying that they didn't have enough information available upon which to base further modelling on, um, what information is missing um, for them? What information do they require uh, and what's the department doing to try and collect that then? Oh, uh, so, uh, so your your question, it's around, uh, they, they just, uh, they, all I was mentioning was there was a paragraph with a caveat saying that they haven't included in their modelling you know, the role of agroecology or changing to wildflower meadows, but that's, you know, it, it's, it's a fairly small area, and there just isn't enough science there, so it's not something the department is moving on. Uh, and indeed, I don't believe it's something the CCC are currently looking at because I'm sure they're waiting on further emerging evidence. Uh, I have spoken to them recently and they have said that you know, they believe their, their modelling is sound. If you, you know, if you look at the methodology report, as I said, there's over 50 pages of items they have modelled in relation to land use. Uh, so not all of those are even going to be possible in any scenario there has to be choices made so what they've looked at is all of the some the best available evidence on the best things that can be done uh, and you know you could never go through that full ccc methodology report and do everything that they suggest because there's simply too much there's seven or eight headings in there and significant number of actions within each but um, and that's the i think i think that's the point there's a balanced pathway but there are there are different ways to get to that pathway uh, and the, the land use and agriculture sector isn't a big part of that pathway. The, the electrification of uh, the U United Kingdom is probably the biggest single part of reaching UK net zero. Uh, so the, that uh, balanced pathway, if you, if you look at that in the sixth carbon budget report and in the, the letter from the Lord Deben to Minister Poots, you'll see that that, that's part. That we're talking part of the solution for land use and agriculture, but it, you know, I, I don't want to overly focus on land use and agriculture because there's much bigger challenges on a UK basis. Okay. Um, and uh, most of the folk, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, uh, I was going to maybe ask there if you want to come back in again because I want to just get around the room and then I can come back in again if you want to. That's right. Yeah. All right. Okay, sure, you can come back in again, Claire. All right. Um, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can thank Colin for his clear and guidance and advice on uh, for us. Um, the Climate Change Committee um, or the experts, they're all the rest of the UK regions have taken on board their advice. Uh, I'm just reading all, I read one comment from them. In every scenario for achieving UK net zero that we have Northern Ireland not get to net zero gas out from emissions by 2050. That's never mind 2045. Um, you would have come, uh, the Climate Change Committee recommendations does ensure that the UK as a whole reaches net zero by 2050. It's not right. Yes, that's right. And uh, in, in relation to your first point, yeah, uh, the, all of the other jurisdictions in the UK have all taken the CCC advice on board to set their targets. So uh, I know most of them set lower targets and have since moved the targets as they've started to uh, improve and as emerging evidence and advice has come. But you know, we're we're at the same stage in terms of advice that the other jurisdictions are but so for example scotland have been told they can get to net zero by 2045 albeit with a, a tailwind scenario so you know that's that's a stretching scenario but it's still a model scenario uh, wales have been told that they can get to or have been advised that net zero by 2050 is uh, just about achievable um, england have been given their targets 
in Northern Ireland, as you say, have been told there's no credible pathway to net zero by 2050 by the CCC. So everybody's legislation, uh, England, Scotland and Wales, have got the, you know, the CCC advice has been taken in it. Uh, currently, as drafted, the private members' bill doesn't, and that's that's probably my main concern as an official, you know, providing evidence. Yeah, I think, I think it, for, for me, it would be totally reckless uh, and, and silly to ignore the clear guidance of the Climate Change Committee. Uh, for me, for me, I'm I'm a farmer all my life, and I understand agriculture. Uh, it's a massive a contributor to the agri-food sector to Northern Ireland. I think we need need to be very careful how we manage this. And, and uh, again, even we did do what uh, the Premier members bill is proposing to do, it would only reduce the overall reduction to very very small, many very minimal amount overall. So I think we. I think I would urge all those that are uh, supporting the private members' bill to be to be cautious and sensible with this. Yeah, thanks, William. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you know, uh, as I say, you know, we go on advice, and the advice at the minute is that there isn't a credible pathway to net zero. So that's that's all I can report back. Uh, you know, I think. The important thing in the climate change debate is to get everybody to buy in and get everybody to come along with us. And I fear that you know some the, the agriculture sector have been particularly vocal about not coming along with us. But even you know I think the energy sector, who, the energy strategy is talking about net zero carbon by 2050, and that's something that the CCC have modelled to get to the at least 82 percent. But 2045 poses a number of challenges. Uh, such a you know the. Is there a possibility of increased fuel poverty? Is there a possibility of early scrappage of uh, assets that, you know, as technologies emerge, uh, the modelling currently suggests 2050 would be the time to aim for net zero for carbon? So I think that's really about getting buy-in of all sectors, and that's what I would like to do through whatever bill comes forward. Okay. Okay. Thank you, William. Very much. Okay. Uh, Philip? Uh, Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, I just want to start by reading uh, from the Climate Action and Law Development, uh, sorry, Low Carbon Development Bill 2021, which is from the South, just given some of the stuff that Colin has said. I mean, in terms of uh, the, the official uh, department website, it's saying the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Amendment Bill 2021 will support a uh, transition to net zero and achieve a climate neutral economy by no later than 2050. It will establish a legally binding framework with clear targets and commitments set in law and ensure the necessary structures and processes are embedded on a statutory basis. So, I mean, that, that's what the, the Irish government are saying on their website in relation to their bill. So, I, I don't think, I mean, we can quibble about language, but I don't think uh, there's any dispute that they intend to be net zero by 2050, and that's what the bill uh, w will intend to be. I mean, th this is a very important discussion that we're having today, and I suppose there, there are, uh, it's important that we do get things right. I mean, I, I note Colin, uh, just before he, he finished up his answer to William there, he said it's important, the important thing in, all, in the climate debate is to bring people along. And that is important, Colin, but I, but I think the important thing in the climate debate is to ensure that we produce uh, laws and take action that, that provide for a sustainable uh, world moving forward for our young children, because there's no point bringing people along if we're not prepared to set ambitious targets and not deal with the science of the situation where we are in danger of reaching a point of global warming that is irre irre irreversible and does untold damage to uh, the environment that we live in. So I mean, there are two narratives here, and it's important that both are given equal uh, access and that we get this, th this thing right. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the consultation today, and I know the minister uh, led heavily on it in the chamber the other day. I mean, can I just ask for a clarification? If the majority of respondents to the consultation from the department's uh, point of view uh, actually advocated for a, a, a bill which uh, had target of net zero by 2045, you know, and showed ambition, uh, I mean, I, I also think 
it's important to put on record because we couldn't challenge the minister uh, the other day in the chamber to put on record, uh, you know, how insulting his comments were in relation to this private member's bill when he described it uh, as a Disneyland bill. I mean, I, I think that is really insulting. I think it's particularly result, uh, insulting from a minister from a party who gave us uh, the RHI scheme, and it's even more insulting from a party who gave us uh, Brexit to be talking about Disneyland politics. You know, I, I think if we were to follow uh, the DUP and the minister, you know, in, in 20 years we'll end up with like a scene from ap- Apocalypse Now. So, I mean, and, and I'm always struck by the comments from less than a year ago that the minister made uh, about not uh, believing that we were in a climate emergency. I think all of that needs to be in the background of, of all our thinking when we're coming to looking at, at this bill. The bill has been narrowed down to agriculture. Uh, and, and, and it shouldn't be. I mean, agriculture is an important sector here in the north, I and mean, it is important, Colin, as you say, that, that, that people and sectors are brought along, brought along. But this bill is about much more than just agriculture. This is about economy, it's about infrastructure, it's about energy, it's about uh, uh, the north playing its part and being ambitious. Uh, and, you know, science is evolving. And I, I know you, you've talked about other places and regions following the science and the CCC, but, you know, Scotland has shown more ambition and has set a, a, a target of 2045. Wales has set more ambitious targets uh, as well in terms of net zero. So, you know, in, in a world where this is becoming the most focal point, you know, places are going to be set net zero. And the chair has already said in terms of the south, you know, the south on this island have set net zero at least by 2050. And agriculture set out uh, a, a roadmap for agriculture to meet that. And throughout this process, we will be looking at the science uh, and taking advice from all the people. Can I ask, just in terms of the, the work that you have done, because whilst it shouldn't be focused on agriculture, it has. Agriculture in the north has evolved for the last 30 to 50 years without any action on climate change. And it will, involve, it will evolve in the next 50 years without any action on climate change. Has there been any analysis of the impact on climate change if we don't take measures uh, in terms of the kind of uh, numbers we will be farming and the impact on farming and the impact on our economy? Because, I mean, I, I think that's an important argument that we need to be having as well. Okay, um, I probably need you to remind me of a few of them. I'll run out of, run out of paper here, Philip. Okay. Uh, the first one I will say, Minister's comments, not touching any of that. I'm here as an official to provide official advice. I'm not, n- not even getting involved. Um, so I suppose your first one was around the Irish bill and all, all I stated, all I really wanted to raise was that you know, the bill doesn't say net zero anywhere within the bill. Um, I, know, I know the website you're talking about and it starts off Ireland net zero, but then all of the quotes from all of the officials, not one of them mentioned net zero as far as I know from looking at it. And it's just something I wanted to raise as a question. I'm sure their committee will raise the same thing. And I know Claire has noted the same thing. It's just, you know, really all I'm saying is why would you not say it? If uh, it's, it's a very convoluted way of setting a target. I'm not uh, saying anything against the Irish bill. I'm just raising the question of why it doesn't mention net zero on the face of it and something I wanted to make you aware of. I don't know enough about it to uh, say it does or it doesn't, but carbon neutrality is a term that worries me because it's a very good way of greenwashing um, for businesses, etc. sometimes where they say they're carbon neutral and essentially what they do is buy uh, carbon units from someone else. So that, that's, it's just, I think it's really that word that sparked a bit of worry in me because it's a word that I've uh, had an issue with for a while uh, because it, it, it doesn't really mean enough. Yeah, so well, it actually says, it doesn't say, it says climate neutrality. Yeah, all right, so it's just climate neutrality doesn't have any definition anywhere. Uh, the, the, you know, they've mentioned, they've given a definition in the bill, but uh, it's, it's the word neutrality that concerns me rather than net zero, Philip. So right. as I said... The, as the, the climate said neutrality in, refers to reducing all greenhouse gases to the point of zero while eliminate, eliminating all other negative environmental impacts that an organisation may cause. So, I mean, I, I've just got you a definition for climate neutrality. But yeah, uh, yeah, I don't but think that, that, that means uh-huh. that, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's the definition of carbon neutrality, is it not? Because that again means that you can buy, but that means you can buy carbon credits to offset your emissions. So you don't actually have to reduce your emissions at all under carbon neutrality. 
Uh, so no, it's just it's something I'm, uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, let's not get into an argument over this, Philip. It's just something I'm, I'm raising to you, a, a, an issue I have with the whole neutrality side of things. And Claire, you know, Claire has agreed with me, and Claire and I mightn't have agreed too often in this committee. So it's it's a win for me today. Okay. Uh, but let's, you know, we, we, we'll not we'll not fall out over that, Philip. It's just it's something I wanted to raise over the wording that. Uh, I don't have the answer to it. it. It may be perfectly fine, and it may actually, during their Oryctus committee stage, be changed to something a bit more towards net zero. So, but it's just something I wanted to raise. Um, so now, in terms of the, let me see, what other questions did you have? Yeah, so the consultation results. So uh, the consultation, there wasn't a net zero by 2045 option in the consultation. It was net zero by 2050 or else following the evidence. And uh, I think we've been through this one before. So there was a, a large campaign response. And it, uh, you had told us at the last committee, it was from the Ulster Wildlife Trust, where a lot of people just sent in a standard email. Uh, and as is standard in our consultations, you know, that is taken as a campaign response. The person didn't put across their own views on the questions, and many of them may not have, have read the consultation. So those are grouped. And that is to stop people frustrating a consultation response by doing a campaign. I'm not saying in this reason, but there can be more nefarious reasons for doing that, you know, particularly from uh, people who have a vested interest in, in a consultation towards uh, something which can make them some money, for example. So it's a standard practice, and you know, I'm quite happy to defend the way that we've done that. There were, I think, 430 responses taken as campaign responses. There may have been some other responses from that same organization where the people took time to answer all the questions and didn't just use the standard template. That wouldn't have been flagged up as a campaign response. So I can't say for definite whether that was or wasn't because we don't know what the background to everybody was. But it's, it's a quite clear way to stop because otherwise every consultation would then be just bombarded with campaign responses. You know, what was to stop another group who had a different view then doing the same thing, getting all their members? And then you just get into silly territory. So that's why we do that. Colin, can I just say something there? You, you said previously that you're there as an official to present the evidence, but that's conjecture on your part where you're speculating that many may not have read the consultation. Well, well they, they, what I'm it's, saying, it's, actually I insul I'm, it's actually insulting to people who respond to that consultation. But the people, it, it, was, a, it was a standard email that was forwarded on. So, yeah. uh, but, but what's know, what's what's uh, the facts in terms of the responses? What's the facts? You know, did the majority of respondents uh, want a net zero by twenty fifty or not? Well, once the consultation was waited, they did not. On the basis of that campaign, yes, there was more respondents said they wanted that. Right. But you know, if and, and I'm going to I'm going to stick very strongly on this one. If we were to accept that, then every consultation any government department done would just be frustrated by campaign responses by people with vested interests wanting to skew a consultation. You know, we take uh, everybody's uh, anybody any personal views over and above the what was included in the campaign email response were logged and mapped against the questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay then. Oh, so I've still have a few more <laughs> answers for Philip <laughs> yet. Um, yeah. So uh, Philip talked about you know the ambition of Scotland and Wales to go for net zero, and uh, I think I had dealt with this by an earlier question as well. That was on the basis of updated CCC advice. So. Yes, they, they are being more stretching, but you know, what I would, my, my, again, my official advice there would be that you know, we go with the CCC, but build enough leeway into the bill that we can continue to have flexibility. Um, and there was another question around climate laws need to be sustainable laws. And yes, I would agree. And I suppose it's then, again, the definition of sustainability is that uh, a sustainability around both environment and economy or purely environmental sustainability or and on the basis of the current evidence again uh, i think there there are too many economic impacts on net zero for 2045 for northern ireland to say that it could be fully sustainable um, and that's just my reading of it at present okay thanks colin um Harry? Okay, and thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Colin. Um, nice to hear your opening statement there. I'm looking at it from a sensible approach. Very good. 
few wee questions, we'll just go through them one at a time, if that's okay, Carl. Do you think, do you not think that um, the 20, 50, 80, 2% target is already over ambitious with us coming out of COVID? Uh, uh, all, uh, as I keep saying, uh, the at least 82% target is what we've been advised of, Harry, and you know that is that's where I'm coming from. It. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I try not to get my personal thoughts and feelings involved in this in an official capacity. I think it's important to do that. You know, uh, I know there's a lot of very passionate people on this committee about all of the various sectors and elements. But what I'm trying to do is is simply give. Uh, you know, what we have been given as advice and trying to convey that to the committee. You know, and I apologize for the last sound like conjecture uh, in terms of the consultation. It was really it was really to try and get across the fact that we try to make you know we try to run every consultation in a standard way. So you know I apologize for making it sound that I was giving any personal feeling there. Uh, I don't want any anybody to feel that their their consul their response wasn't valued and wasn't counted. But it's just it's just how we count those to send out the right message and consultation. But sorry, back to your point, Harry. Um, on the basis, the information is at least 82%. So 82% is really what sort of, if you like, the bottom line we're aiming for. But we want to aim much higher. So if you legislation probably sets, you know, a, an achievable target, but one, and then the ambition comes as we develop the policies. Uh, I think on my last committee appearance, I talked about the greenhouse gas projections, and it really says that Northern Ireland aren't well placed with policies outside of uh, energy policy to have a lot more emissions. So, you know, I want to see a bill get through and I want to get us on the path. And working in DERA, I fully expect to be heavily involved in working on that path. So I don't want to be too critical of anybody or or any bill, but I want one that works. Okay. I think the rationale for that is to acknowledge um, higher agri levels in Northern Ireland for health population compared to parts of the UK. Yeah, and I think that's what the CCC really recognised in their advice was that you know in order for Northern Ireland to still continue to uh, provide protein for uh, GB and beyond, the, the the target was set at a lower level than England, Scotland, and Wales. Yeah. Uh, and I think you know it, not not getting into whether agriculture you know the agriculture still has to do an awful lot, even at that at least eighty two percent target. They're by no means getting a uh, buy ball. But it's it's around not just shifting emissions elsewhere, and I think that was one of the important points that Lord Deben made in his letter. Yeah, yeah. And listen, do you think growth within the sector is achievable in tandem with the implementation of the bill, or would the bill like outwork and strengthen the economy and impact on jobs stuff within the sector? Uh, so, uh, in terms of growth, I suppose it, it's how you look at growth. You know, there there are lots of different types of growth. Uh, the probably the growth in livestock would be the most difficult livestock you know or the or the main issue in terms of emissions in agriculture but there are there are lots of other ways and uh, if you i think i think it's worth looking at the the methodology report in relation to agriculture about you know low carbon farming practices agroforestry hedging uh, bioenergy crops there are a whole range of other things and other land uses that can be used, but I still think you know we need to, to some extent, protect our meat and dairy production in this country because of the welfare standards and because of the fact that it would just shift emissions elsewhere because the demand's still there. Really, to uh, allow for growth in other sector in other parts of agriculture, you need to you know change might be. And we're not quite there yet, so we need to we need to work on that. But so to set a target that reduces livestock here doesn't have any overall benefit. Um, that's really what the advice is trying to get across, and what I, I I would also agree with on the basis of that advice. So too, yeah, appreciate that. Okay, thank you, Colin. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Rosemary. Rosemary? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Colin, I want to just ask you what, ask you just two questions. You referred to the peatlands. You said something about the peatlands, and I'm sorry I maybe didn't hear it all. Can you go back and give 
re repeat what you what you said in relation to their benefits in reaching uh, carbon zero? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, Rosemary, I, I will put my hands up and say I'm no expert in peatland, but uh, so the, the, the peatland emissions from the highly degraded peatlands across the UK are going to be counted in our emissions t uh, figures for the first time, either, I think, it's, I think it's this year or possibly next year. And the estimate at the minute is that Northern Ireland will have about an extra two megatons of carbon emissions a year from peatlands. Now that's significant considering we have only 19 point something megatons of emissions total in Northern Ireland. So that puts our emissions up already. You know, there is, there's a, the answer to that is obviously to repair all of our peatlands. But you know, it's important to realise that repairing peatlands, it's more about stopping emissions than sequestering a lot of carbon. The carbon sequestration from peatlands, as I understand it, takes hundreds if not thousands of years, but you need to keep them in a good condition at all times. It's the amount of emissions they emit by being damaged rather than the amount of emissions they suck in, if you like, by being in good condition. So it's a, you know, the peatland strategy is uh, due to go out shortly. If, uh, and you know, I think that's an important point to raise that there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of risk with the, the emissions coming from peatlands rather than opportunity right now because we're going to have more uh, emissions coming on our, our greenhouse gas inventory. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, one, other, one other thing, it's, it's a relation to the possibility of a second bill uh, being introduced. The two bills will run side by side, I presume, and then does one bill take supremacy over the other, or will the two be? Can the two be uh, merged into one, or what's what is the procedure? Well, this is this is a massively complicated answer, Rosemary, and I probably won't do it justice without a, a solicitor present. But there's nothing in Northern Ireland that stops two bills running alongside each other. There is in other jurisdictions. Um, then there's a you know if two things are mutually in, in, incompatible, uh, they would the, the newer one may usurp the older one. But you would expect during legislative passage that if because one bill would likely pass before the other one, so the second bill going through, you would expect it to be amended in such a way to work with the first bill. It's a it's it's a it's a it's a confused situation and an odd situation. Uh, but unfortunately, there's nothing in the standing orders to prevent two bills, and it does get very confusing. And you know, we are expect you know you would expect then the speaker to sort of work with the right amendments to get the two bills compatible with each other, because you know what it was there's uh, there's probably positives in both bills, uh, but you know the ultimate aim is to get a climate change act in line with the new decade new approach, uh, but. I, I'm just here today, again, as I, I keep repeating, to give what the evidence and advice we have currently is. Uh, we will be providing a more detailed response on to your call for views uh, that the committee has put out, just you know, to highlight some of maybe the drafting issues with the private members bill that would need fixed to make it more operable. Uh, but So that will be at an official level. So, uh, but other than that, it's, it's a very confusing situation, and it's one that we keep trying to take legal advice on because of the, the confusion around it. it. I don't believe it has ever happened before in Northern Ireland, but it doesn't, it can't, it's not prevented from happening. All right. So the two could, the, in essence, the two could, two could run, run along parallel to each other for quite some time? Well, uh, they could, I suppose they could run along parallel to each other until the end of the mandate, in which case, both, you know, if neither passed, both would fall. If one passed, the other would fall, etc. <clears throat> so uh, you know, the mandate is short, and the need for climate legislation is clear. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's it's a it's a it's a confusing situation, I have to say, and I don't know if uh, Anthony or Arlene wanted to add any more on that. No. No, that, no, so that, that's really it, Rosemary. Uh, uh, the simple answer is yes, the two of them can run alongside each other, and then it's up to the committee and the assembly and all the rest to ensure they, they can work with each other or they don't contradict each other. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Colin. Thanks. Thank you, Rosemary.
at Morris. Morris? I'm sorry, Chair. You right? Issues there, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Colin, for your, for your information uh, to the committee this sorry, morning. Wait a second, Morris. Can, can all members mute who aren't speaking? Because there's a bit of interference there. Right, so, sorry, Morris. Carry away there. Sorry. Oh, right. Thanks, Colin, for your information uh, to the committee this morning. Uh, uh, read the climate change. But can I ask the uh, Please have information. The Climate Change Committee of the UK is a renowned organisation. Would there be a reliance on their expertise globally or uh, external to the UK or just within the UK? So they are, you know, they, their, their advice relates to the UK only, but mm -hmm. I would say they are world renowned you know, and world respected. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine, like, just as all of these advisory bodies will do, they will look at each other's evidence, but that's probably at an unofficial level. I don't know enough about the inner workings, but mm -hmm. I'm sure the CCC are coming to brief you at some stage. I think they're mm -hmm. fairly essential to come and brief the committee. Uh, so it's probably a good question to ask them too. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Colin. Colin, look, I, I have no political mindset, just a desire uh, to ensure the best possible outcome for Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. And I strongly believe in a climate change bill for the benefit of our children uh, coming after us. And I also make no apology for thinking that successive governments have not given proper protection to our environment over the past decades. But it has been indicated the cost of the private members' bill could be in the region of £900 million. Pounds. That cost could be borne and will be borne from the Northern Ireland budget if I picked you up right. Uh, money that would be would go a long way towards other budgets like health, etc. Uh, and for an overall benefit to the UK of 0.73, uh, again if I picked you up right, and globally 0.073. Could I ask you, Colin, could you clarify something for me that the Chair had alluded to? And it's just for information. Uh, and that was that our neighbours in Southern Ireland would achieve their net zero targets by 2050 and that Northern Ireland would not. Is this a factual statement or an aspirational statement? Okay, so I suppose to cover the costs, first of all, so the, the nine, extra £900 million pounds per annum is for Northern Ireland to get to net zero if we used mm -hmm. engineered removal technologies. We don't actually have any economic impacts for net zero by 2045 yet. The CCC haven't been able to model them because they're so far outside of what they feel is possible. Um, as I said in the opening remarks, they think we'd just be buying buying carbon credits from elsewhere in the UK to do it, which is again costly. Um, yeah, you're correct. My reading of the HMT principles on funding are that HMT principle 10 is mm -hmm. that uh, when something like this that Northern Ireland are essentially deciding they're going to do this against the wider advice, we would bear the costs ourselves. So, you know, I think it's fair to assume possibly more than 900 million. Plus, uh, there, are all the, there are all the costs already, although I think the, the costs are outweighed by the benefits of UK getting to net zero. That's fairly clear <coughs> on the basis of the evidence. Um, so that, that's to deal with the first question, Morris. And then uh, in terms of, uh, I suppose, net zero by 2050, I suppose with uh, with all legislation, it's just an aspiration now. Uh, you know, we have uh, we have a pathway for UK net zero by 2050, but it's still it is still an aspiration. There's still an awful lot of big big changes needed. You know, I think of some of the changes, and it you know it, it frightens me, but it excites me at the same time. You know, all cars going electric, enough charging points to charge all those cars. Maybe all public transport going to hydrogen or something like that. All our heating moving away from gas and oil. You know, super insulated houses, heat pumps, big, 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 big changes. And you know, 30 years feels like a long time, but is it really a long time to do all of that plus an awful lot more? Um, changing diets, uh, ch changing how how we work, changing how we live. Uh, it's aspirational, but it's a very good aspiration to have. And uh, I share the, your first comment about, you know, we want to do right by the environment and we want to do right for climate change. Um, you know, that is my ultimate aim. And, you know, as an official, uh, I will have to work with whatever I'm given, but, uh, you know, I have to provide the advice that net zero by 2045 for Northern Ireland doesn't appear achievable on present information. Uh, but, you know, certainly climate ambition is something we all need. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thanks very much for that, Colin. And Colin, my final point uh, is just something that Rosemary had touched on. Uh, and, and my concern uh, is that the private members bill and the apartments bill could be incompatible in some uh, aspects and, and not complementary in others, but both have the same desired effect, and that is to reduce emissions by 2050. Can we as a committee, maybe you can't answer this, can we as a committee scrutinise both bills at the same time? Uh, well, I think the chair would be better to answer that one than me, but I think you generally would scrutinise one piece of legislation, then the next. When these are so similar, you know, if it, the bill still has to be tabled at the executive and agreed and introduced and uh, you know, voted on at second stage, there's a lot, still a lot of ifs there. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I, I'm sure in such an exceptional circumstance, like for example, I'm sure the assembly researchers could do a paper comparing and contrasting the two bills and saying whether they're compatible and incompatible. Uh, but I think maybe I'll turn that one over to the chair to see what he thinks. Well, mm -hmm. I suppose as, as you said earlier, Colin, that we're, we're in unprecedented territory. And I do know that for the next six months, we have a very uh, robust and challenging um, consultation process and scrutiny process ongoing here uh, at the committee. So um, it would be, be extremely challenging to, uh, to craft on another uh, bill uh, at the same time. It would be extremely challenging, so it would. Sorry, sorry for putting in the chair, uh, the chair in the spot there. But, uh, uh, well, it was kind of me on that, so. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, um, Chair. Colin, just before I move on there, I just want to just ask a question. You had mentioned the £900 million per annum was, was mentioned um, uh, as... Uh, and this relates to engineering and removal technologies, and I just know that this will this will make the headline. You know, the nine hundred million per annum. Has there been any any analysis done um, of the cost of uh, other other solutions that are out there? Like your colleagues were here last week at the committee and talked about on farm solutions such as the the calving intervals, the finishing times for cattle, the, the use of clover in in the in the diets, the minerals, even seaweed is a has been a, something that's looked at in cattle. So has anything been considered uh, outside the uh, removal tech engineered re removal technologies? Um, you know, and I mentioned earlier, you know, the the South has their their marginal abatement cost curve with a 26 uh, action points outline, which includes a lot of these solutions, which I don't believe are as costly as was being suggested. So, has there been anything, any consideration given to uh, you know, like knowledge sharing and uh, that that sort of um, approach as yeah, well so as the engineered solutions? I, I, need, I need to go back a few steps in this one. Yeah. So, the original. At least 82% target includes all of those things that are modelled, so low carbon practices, more agroforestry, more hedging, putting some land over to other uses, changing our diets, so there's a 20% reduction in beef and a 35% reduction in dairy, or possibly the other way about, because I can't remember, uh, maybe using some uh, land for bio crops. Uh, there are a whole range of those things have already been modelled in the balanced pathway. So this extra 900 million pound for en if engineered greenhouse gas removal technologies, that's just to bridge, help bridge the gap between the at least 82% and net zero by 2050. Mm. So <clears throat> that was an extra thing. So all of those things you've mentioned, a lot of those have already been included. And I would suggest, you know, you have a look at the the carbon method, sixth carbon budget, carbon methodology report, the agriculture and land use sector part of it. So there's an awful lot modelled in that, and that is really where the you know, those interventions come in. So the, the extra thing we had written to the CCC to ask, you know, how would we get on from this at least 82% to net zero? And they, they said they couldn't model for 2045, but by 2050. You know, uh, you do more. Every sector do more than they had thought possible through the tailwind scenario, mm -hmm. plus a further fifty percent reduction in beef and, and and dairy or livestock. Sorry, that wouldn't quite get us to net zero by twenty fifty. And then another solution was engineered greenhouse gas removal technologies of uh, about nine hundred million pounds per annum by twenty fifty to get us there. So they're just other options to fill that. You know, that gap between the at least 82% and the net zero for Northern Ireland, which, as I've said, even though those staggering costs, you're still only getting an extra 0.73% off UK emissions. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, the greenhouse gas removal technologies would be much more optimally placed elsewhere in the UK. I, I believe Scotland is being highlighted as the best location because of all the land they have, etc. So that's where that's where those figures come from. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Colin. Um, um, William and Claire, William, are you looking back in there again? Just a second. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For me, the, the, this is quite simple. We all want to see emissions reduced. Uh, and at the end of the day, this, the Climate Change Committee's recommendations ensures that the UK reaches net zero by 2050. We are part of the UK, so we are achieving that. Why should we risk wrecking our agri-food sector uh, to, reach, to try and reach by 2045, which will have no real impact? We, we already are... Uh, under the guidelines or the recommendations by the Climate Change Committee, going to reach net zero in the UK by 2050, even under the recommendations for Northern Ireland. For me, it's very easy. Uh, you, you accept the the Climate Change Committee's recommendations and be sensible about this. Very, very simple to me. Okay. Th thank you, um, William. Um, th that, that's, a, that's a comment. Uh, do you need, is there, as a comment, Colin, or do you want to respond to that? Or? Oh, I took it as a comment, yeah. and I suppose I made I made a similar comment yeah. in my opening, really, around uh, you know, do we want those extra economic impacts? And that's a question for the committee, not for me. Do we want yeah. to you. bear those extra economic impacts? Thank you, um, and Claire. Thanks, Chair. We're coming through, okay? Yeah, we can not see you, but we can hear you. That's always best. <laughs> Listen, Colin, good to hear you saying that there's probably good things contained within the bill. That was quite encouraging. But I want to go back to a few things that are in there. The, the carbon tracking scheme, the nitrogen budgets and stuff as well. So we know that Northern Ireland ranks 12th worst in the world on biodiversity from recent reports and 95% of our lakes don't meet water framework directive standards. So the PMB includes indicators for biodiversity, for soil quality, water quality. The department agree with the need to include these as indicators and i'd be keen also to hear um so the bill also provides for nitrogen budgets similar to the provisions found in the scottish bill um so have officials had any interaction with their scottish counterparts in relation to how they manage these nitrogen budgets and just the last thing to ask i suppose is is there a content with the duty contained within the bill to create a tracking scheme for carbon usage, including the carbon units purchased, um, what type of work would be required maybe to set that scheme up? And is there one envisaged? Is that something the, the department bill is working on? So uh, in terms of the carbon budgets and carbon tracking, I think I think the, the issue, and we'll be sending the call for, for views, is that there's probably not enough information in the private members bill to make an assessment of exactly that would what that would entail. So yeah, a carbon tracking scheme and setting of carbon budgets are both pretty much essential things for any climate change legislation, but we really we would need more information to make an assessment on how that would be done. We have, uh, you know, we have carbon accounting uh, provisions within our, uh, or the department's bill. So, uh, you know, that's something we would probably feed into and call for views and just explain, you know, what uh, sort of extra bits you might need in the drafting in order to make that work. Uh, so that's what I can say there. Uh, in terms of nitrogen budgets, I've had a few very unofficial conversations with Scotland about them. It's not something we've looked at in any great detail because uh, I don't know if we really yet have the infrastructure to fully track all of this. And I think that's something that was raised in the assembly research paper as well. So again, it's it's something there probably needs to be more detail on in the private members bill or uh, maybe, you know, some detail on how the secondary regulations might work or something like that. So it's probably difficult for me to comment on that. In terms of biodiversity, water quality and soil quality, which I believe are the other areas. So, you know, uh, improving all of those things, I'm never going to say that's not a good thing. Uh, I think the reason we probably didn't consider them for our bill is it really it, it widens the scope of the bill well beyond the climate change bill into an environment bill. So those sort of things, some of them are governed by retained EU legislation and other legislation already. So it's how 
they interact with each other, which would need considered, and the private members bill probably needs a bit more uh, thought to that. Uh, but you know, they're, they're, they're all things that we need to improve on. Uh, you know, I'm, nobody from the Department of Agriculture and Environment is ever going to say that we don't need to improve on these things. Uh, but I, th I think there's just a bit more work needs to be done on the drafting of what exactly that would entail. And also, there, there is a question over whether the CCC could provide uh, expert advice on biodiversity, water quality and soil quality. Uh, I, I don't believe at present they're set up to, so it's probably something that a conversation needs to be had with in advance of this bill being passed, just to make sure you're not putting a duty on a body that can't deliver it or that uh, would cost so much to deliver, we couldn't afford to pay them to do it. So uh, I hope that's answered all your questions kind of clear. There's, there's still a lot of investigation needs to be done on some of these points. Okay, okay. thanks very Thank much. Thank you, yeah. Claire. Um, okay then, um, Colin, Arlene and Anthony, I uh, want to thank you very much for, for joining us the, this morning and for your very detailed and uh, comprehensive answers to, to the, our questions. And um, listen, we're very grateful for that and we um, undoubtedly will be uh, meeting with you again as the climate change uh, bill or bills uh, uh, roll out. So thank you very much and hope you have a nice day. Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I just again offer that you know I'm happy to contribute at any time as required, and you know just to apologise again in my comment over the consultation. So I was kind of referring to there's been consultations in other jurisdictions that have been sort of attacked by bots, or, or that has been reported they've been attacked by you know not actual people sending in you know multiple of the same responses, and that's one of the reasons why we changed that. So uh, you know I didn't mean to offend anybody, and I apologise profusely f for any thought that it might have offended somebody. No problem. Thank, thank, thank you very much for that, Colin. Okay. Thank you for your time. No problem. Take care. Okay, well, uh, see you again. Okay, members, right. um, we're going to move on now to uh, item six on the agenda, a written briefing, consultation and amendments to the Marine Licensing Order, NA 2011. It's a, a nine-week consultation. The papers are from the department at page 26. The department intends to launch a consultation uh, on the amendments to this uh, licensing Exempted Activities Order uh, on the 20th of May, uh, for, as I say, for nine weeks. It's advised that the NA Exempted Activities Order has not been significantly amended since its inception in 2011. Therefore, there is therefore a risk that it may become dated and not adequately responsive to the needs of users of the marine environment. The amendments will ensure that there is a consistent approach uh, to marine licensing acro across our, our waters and indeed the, uh, across the, the UK. The proposed changes to the exempted activities order are intended to ensure that the marine license system remains proportionate to the risk to the environment, human health, and other users of the sea and other users of the sea. And its operation is efficient and coherent. Um, okay, I'll just check. So, um, if members are okay with this, can I get agreement to uh, that request the department gives us an analysis of the consultation responses in due course? Agreed? Okay. Um, William, William, if you can hear me, you might need a mute there. William, you might need a mute. Okay. Um, so, a written briefing then, item seven, uh, transition update. A uh, written update from the department. Um, um, at page 115, um, and the departments has agreed to give us a monthly update going forward. And if you have any questions on the uh, on this uh, recent update, could you fire them on to uh, Nick uh, the um, by close of play today? I um, want to refer members to the correspondence at page 121. That's item number eight in your agenda. Uh, there's correspondence. Uh, one one that I do note is from the finance committee for finance at page 447 regarding plans to take oral and written evidence on the establishment of an independent fiscal council for ANA and the potential role and powers of such a council. The Committee for Finance has written to all statutory committees to seek views on this proposal. The clerk has written to the committee members seeking um, the uh, return of comments by the 3rd of June. Um, so can members um, probably, uh, if possible, if you haven't responded to Nick, could you maybe forward your uh, views in uh, by 
today, or what, what's your deadline, Nick? Um, by the middle of next week, chair, if possible. Yeah. Can members forward their views on this to Nick by the, by the, by the uh, middle of next week, if possible? Okay. And are members content to be action the remainder of the correspondence uh, as indicated on the index sheet of page 119? Okay. Um, members, page nine, uh, item 9 on the agenda. Uh, forward work programme at page 537. Uh, Minister Poots has confirmed that he will be attending this meeting um, uh, on the uh, 3rd of June ne next week to discuss the, uh, the ports uh, issue. And I will advise that the committee staff have commenced the issuing of invites to stakeholders to provide oral evidence to the committee on the Climate Change Bill. The Woodland Trust is now confirmed for the 3rd of June, with others to be confirmed in due course. I'd like to advise members that an additional ad hoc meeting will be organised on a fully virtual basis for Wednesday, 16th of June, after 2 p.m., to provide capacity to invite stakeholders to give evidence on the climate change bill, and details will be discovered that will be circulated in due course. Uh, so, can you get agreement for that work for work programme? Okay, uh, members. Um, moving on to item number 10 now. Is there any other business that members wants to uh, raise? Okay, members. Okay, right, members. The, the date and time of the next meeting is Thursday, the third of June, uh, next Thursday at nine thirty a.m. And this will be a hybrid meeting uh, streamed on the assembly website. And members, we're going to just move briefly into a closed session. Uh, can I seek agreement for the members to move into closed session? Is that okay? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.